we're going to uh, switch gears a little bit with chapter five. We are actually going to repeat a lot of the mathematical steps that we did in chapter chapters two and three. Uh, but with a new variable. So now the number of particles can change. So before, we consider uh, two systems, so system one, and system two. And in general, you know, they had their own temperatures and they also had you know, their energy and their volume. So when we brought them in contact equilibrium, I mean, in thermal equilibrium, Ah, oh, I'm a little bit too nervous, sorry. In thermal contact, like this, what happened? Which variables change and which ones didn't change? Did the temperatures change? What happened to the temperatures? So if T1 was higher, then uh, it will go lower and T2 will go higher, right? What will happen to their entropies? Well, before the entropy is just the multiplicity, so the natural log of the multiplicity. So if you um, had both of them separate at the beginning when you put them together, the system tries to maximize the combined multiplicity, the combined entropy. And that is what changed the temperature. Actually, that is the definition of temperature. What the particles, I mean, what the systems were allowed to, to exchange was the energy. So we had the condition that the total energy, U1 plus U2 was constant, which is a good thing. Oops. And so the derivative of u was zero. Right? And so the u1 was negative the u2. So up to here, everything is, I think, pretty clear. So if T1 was higher than T2, what can we say about its energy? So uh, actually, we don't know too much about that because the energy is an extensive system, right? But if we also have number of particles, then what we can say is that the, ener the energy per particle was higher in system one. So the condition that we had for the particles was that um, you know, N1 remained N1 forever and N2 remained N2 forever. So now what we're gonna do is that we're going to relax that condition and we are going to allow this system 
and so that it looks prettier. Let me put this system on a big reservoir of temperature tau so that both of them have the same temperature. You know, they are in thermal contact with the reservoir. Um, actually, I only wanted to get rid of the subscripts. So both of them have T. Um, and now we put a kind of a valve over here and you can open it and, and close it. So now we have a condition that is similar to this one. And we had the, the total energy conserved. So now N, the number of particles, which is equal to N1 plus N2, it's going to be constant, but they're going to be able to move. So the derivative of N is going to be equal to zero. And that's going to be equal to, that's going to be dN1 plus dN2. And so dN1 equals minus dN2. So if particles move, from this one to this one, then the number of particles decreases here by the same number that the number of particles increases over here. So pretty straightforward. We had conservation of energy before, and now we have conservation of mass. So something that we learned before so I guess I'm going to put this one over here. Is that the free energy is always minimized. So the free energy of this system F is the free energy of the first one plus the free energy of the second one. And this is all the free energy is the internal energy. minus tau sigma, the product of the temperature and the entropy. So then this one is going to be u1 plus u2 minus the temperature, which is the same for both of them because we, we put this, uh, these two systems on top of a reservoir. So this is going to be then the entropy of the first one as the entropy of the second one. If the free energy is, um, it's going to be a minimum, but right? if it's an, an extreme, then that's going to happen when it's derivative is equal to zero. So if n can change, then the derivative, partial derivative of F1 with respect to N1, the n, so this is the total derivative, plus the partial derivative of F2 with respect to N2, uh, this is the N1, 
the n2 that's equal to zero. So this one up here, you know, it's uh, equation one. Uh, this one over here. So now, because we have this condition over here, that the n one equals negative the n two, we can rewrite this with a negative over here, and this will be the n one. So we write um, that equation in terms of only n one, and this one. It's going to be with the replacement by point three. So I guess I still have some space over there. Well, I don't have much space. So this part over here. It's going to be equal because we have the zero over here. To partial derivative of the free energy of the second system with respect to n2. Then we have dn1 on both sides. So we can get rid of the dn1. Does this look familiar? This is equation 5.4. Does this relationship look familiar? We hadn't we, we hadn't seen it before. But when we were uh, mathematically yep, one one equals the other one, right? And what did we use this for? Right, so this is one over the temperature. That is correct. So we're going to use this as, you know, just before or, or a similar approach to define the temperature. The partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of particles. And this is at constant temperature and also at constant volume. Is the definition of the chemical potential. This is mu. Tau. Uh, N and V. This is equation uh, 5.5. 5. So have you heard about the, the uh, chemical potential before? What is it? Uh huh. That is that is about half correct. <laughs> so okay, one last thing before we move on to the discussion. 
because this is a definition of the chemical potential that we can write this, which is the condition for a diffusive equilibrium as mu1 equals mu2, right? So this is the chemical potential of the second system, chemical potential of the first system. This equation 5.6. Okay. So um, the who was speaking? Okay. Uh, that's so the potential part was correct. This is a potential just like like the gravitational potential or uh, you know, the, the voltage. Uh, it is a potential. Um, but the chemical, you know, as a word, um, I mean, yes, it is used in chemistry. It is used everywhere. Um, but chemistry in physics means it's more about how the particles of a system or the, the components of a system are arranged, right? So um, I don't know if this is like a, an older definition and the name was kept, um, but this is, this is a, an interesting quantity. So let's see what it does. Let's say that we have a two segment situation. In the first part, we have two systems that are separate. We have tau two and tau one. This is system one, this is system two. And initially, tau one was greater than tau two. Then we just bring them together, we put them together. We have, uh, what's gonna happen is that tau one is gonna become equal to tau two. So both of them are going to have the same temperature. So thermal equilibrium, um, I can put it over here. Thermal equilibrium is the same thing as saying that the temperatures are the same. And so the temperature regulates, this is a good word that you tell you this, regulates the energy transfer. So if one of the temperatures is higher, let's say T1, then T1 is going to send energy to, I mean, S1 is going to send energy to S2. Now we have um, these two temperatures. Let's say that they are already the same, the same temperature, so we don't have to worry. 
D1 equals D2 equals D or tau. But now this has a chemical potential one, chemical potential two. We bring them together. And they're going to have the same chemical potential. Well, I'm going to leave this one here. This kind of equilibrium is called diffusive equilibrium. The same as saying chemical potential of one is equal to the chemical potential of two. So the chemical potential regulates what? Exactly. Okay, so this has to get you thinking about the temperature a little bit deeper. So what this tells you is that, let's say that you know, the same, the same kind of particle, say that you have you know, some nitrogen, molecular nitrogen over here, gas. Um, and you have these two boxes have the same volume, but you put twice as many particles in S1 than in S2. What do you expect the particles to do from your everyday life experience? There's going to be a transfer from S1 to S2 until both of them have the same, the same concentration, right? The same density. So this one initially had the higher chemical potential because it had more particles. And so particles, you know, just like we the gravitational potential, they always go to a lower potential. Systems wanna go to a lower chemical potential. So they will move from this one to this one. So the chemical potential and the temperature are not that different. You, know, you can almost think of the temperature as a potential also. If things wanna go from higher temperature to um, lower temperature. They wanna minimize that, that energy. So of course this one is related to the entropy. So I think that should give you a little bit of pause about what entropy is and what temperature is and what the chemical potential is. So something else that uh, Kittel says, and I also really like this statement, it says the chemical potential is fully as important as the temperature. And in fact, if you allow, even though they are uh, different concepts, if you allow particles to move from one system to the other, the particles carry energy with them. And so essentially you're going to have thermal equilibrium and diffusive equilibrium at the same time. You can have thermal equilibrium without 
having diffusive equilibrium, we saw that you know in the first uh, third or so of the of the course. Uh, you cannot really have diffusive equilibrium without having thermal equilibrium. It will be kind of difficult to achieve. You will need some interesting uh, machinery. Um, so the other, well, I guess I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in detail later, but this chemical potential is completely general. It doesn't tell you, just like the rest of thermodynamics, really, of statistical mechanics, everything comes, everything arises from the, from the math, you know, from counting. Even though systems are subjected to this minimization of the chemical potential, the minimization of the free energy. It doesn't tell you anything about the particular interactions. You know, that's why it is general. So, you know, might be that the particles are bouncing and, you know, so really you have Newtonian mechanics during the interaction of the particles, you know, the electrons repel, so you have electromagnetic interactions. So there's a lot of physics in there. Um, Thermal physics or statmec doesn't doesn't care about the origin of those interactions. What it tells you is that this has to hold. Okay, so this is the, that's a good way to think about it. The the chemical potential is kind of like the temperature. Okay, so we we looked at the ideal gas before. So in KK equation three point seventy, we saw that the free energy of a ideal gas the free energy is a minus tau natural log of the partition function and we found the partition function so the free energy is negative tau natural log of the partition function for one particle in a box to the n, because there's n particles. And then we had to make some uh, correction over here to how we were counting. OK, so the free energy is minus tau. Uh, the n, we can take it out of the natural log. And so we got that. So this is equation 5.8. The partition function for one particle in a box was equal to the quantum concentration times the volume. And the quantum concentration was mass tau divided by two pi h bar to the three halves. Right, so this is stuff that um, we know. So if we want the partition function, we multiply times the volume. And that is equation 5.9. All right, so then the free energy 
sorry, the chemical potential. of the ideal gas was from the definition, the derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of particles at constant temperature and constant volume. So that's equal to the derivative with respect to N of this guy over here. So minus tau, well, there's a smaller square bracket here, n natural log of v1 minus natural log of n factorial. So we can factor that out, you know, the negative uh, doesn't depend, I mean, the temperature doesn't depend on the number of particles. So we can take it out. Minus tau. And then um, we have this product over here. So we have a uh, partial derivative of n with respect to n that's equal to one. And then the natural log of the partition function. The partition function doesn't depend uh, on, well, I guess not, not yet. It does depend. Mm, yeah, not over here. Doesn't depend on the number of particles. So we have Z1. And then we have derivative with respect to n of natural log of n factorial. And n is, of course, a discrete quantity. You don't have half particles. And if you break a particle in half, well, then now you have two particles. So it's a discrete quantity, but in the limit of very large n, you know, Avogadro's number, uh, number of particles, this is essentially uh, continuous, right? And this is okay, everything is quantized, um, quantized anyways, and we still take derivatives of all these quantities. So that's fine. This is equation, All right, so we can take advantage of our friend. Which friend to take this derivative? Right, the Sterling approximation, right? So we're gonna use the, the better one. So remember that the easiest one is just, what is it? Um, natural log of N minus N. Uh, but you can go to uh, higher degrees of approximation. And in that case, so this will be equation Appendix, uh, appendix A, equation 12B. It's gonna be uh, one half, yes, one half natural log of two pi plus n plus one half, and then we have over here natural log of n minus n. So that's a better approximation. So if we take the derivative 
of this with respect to n, then we'll be we'll be taking the derivative of this whole thing with respect to n. So the first term, uh, we don't really care about it. And it's the, we can put the one half in here. So this becomes the square root. But that term doesn't depend on n at all. So we can forget about it. Um, so then it's the derivative. of this thing with respect to n. So what you're going to get, I'm just going to write it down over here. n partial derivative of n natural log of n plus natural log of n. So we're going to have this product over here first. Partial derivative of n with respect to partial derivative of n. So that's the first product n natural log of n. And then for the second one, we have one half derivative with respect to n, natural log of n. And then the second one in which we take the natural log out, well, uh, take the derivative of one half with respect to n, that's zero. So we don't have to put it in there. Um, minus partial derivative of n with respect to n. So the derivative of the natural log is of n is one over n. Uh, this one is equal to one. Um, this one is also equal to one. Oops. And this one is uh, one over n. All right. So n over n, that's equal to one. One minus one, well, it's equal to zero. And so the derivative with respect to n of the natural log of n factorial is natural log of n plus one over two n. So this is equation 5.11. N is really large. So this term goes to zero. This one doesn't. So we can forget about the 2n. And so the derivative with respect to n of the natural log of n factorial is approximately equal to the natural log of n. So good quantity to keep in mind. So then um, we have our chemical potential over here. So we can just replace that. Um, what we got over here, right? So that's going to be minus net log of n.
and this is the chemical potential. So the logs here, you're subtracting one from the other. So we can put them together dividing. Like that. And well, we erased it, but we know what Z1 is. Um, it is um, oh yeah, there's something else that I want to do. We have this negative over here, so we can put it inside the natural log and that will switch the order. So it'll be N divided by Z1. And we don't need these ones anymore. Actually, let's put it over here and put a box around it. So the chemical potential, oops. of the ideal gas is a natural log of N divided by the partition function of the one particle in a box. Let's get rid of everything else so that it looks more, so that it is more clear. So the partition function Uh, was the quantum um, density concentration uh, times the volume. And so N divided by the volume, that gives you regular concentration. So that's just N. Okay. So this is equation 5.12. Mm, what do you mean by probabilistic? Uh -huh. It is, so, you know, So let's say that you have a system over here that is in, in thermal equilibrium. So, you know, energy we typically associated with movement. So if only this side had temperature and this one was, um, you know, zero, then the movement of these particles, the energy will start moving in this direction, right? At some point, you always have a probability that energy is going to move in the opposite direction. But you are correct, probabilistically, there's many more that go in this direction. And that's why it goes into thermal equilibrium. When it reaches thermal equilibrium, it doesn't mean that there's no transfer of energy anymore. What it means is that the transfer of energy from this side to this side is exactly the same as a transfer of energy from this side to this side. And, you know, if you look at a very tiny instance, um, femtoseconds or something like that, you will see that there's a, little, there's a little bit of an imbalance. But if you look at a longer time scale, and it doesn't have to be long at all, probably a nanosecond or something, at the nanosecond scale, you know, the average of each nanosecond is going to be the same. So if you have particles, you know, gas, instead of, of energy, uh, you have exactly the same phenomenon, 
you still have particles moving in this direction. But in diffusive equilibrium, the number of particles moving in this direction is equal to the number of particles moving in the other direction. Did that answer your question? Yes, because um, the n is equal to zero. Right, so you have conservation. Oh, so if you look at a very small time frame, it would be three that move in this direction and two that moved in this direction. Uh, it's a potentially long time scale, and definitely a second. The number of particles is going to be the same. So just like you have fluctuations, and the fluctuations, you know, we have very narrow distribution. We're also going to have fluctuations for the number of particles, but on average, it's going to be zero, and it's, it's going to be very, very narrow. Okay, so there is a more elegant way of deriving the chemical potential. So this is not the chemical potential for everything, but it's the chemical potential for uh, the ideal gas. So if you look at the definition of the chemical potential, the chemical potential to the mu and I think it is like this right I always do it like this sorry about that um, so this is approximately equal to a change in the free energy and change in the number of particles Okay, so if you draw a free energy versus number of particle particles uh, plot, let's say that it looks like that, then the chemical potential is the slope of this plot. So if you let Delta one be equal to one. So you you move one particle. Uh, how does moving that particle, that one particle, change the free energy? Well, then you can move it. You can move the delta n over here, and delta n is equal to one, so we can forget about it. So that delta n, I mean that mu is equal to delta f. So it's gonna be the free energy of n minus the free energy of n minus one. So let me see where I can put it. So I'm gonna get rid of these parts. So we know the free energy of the ideal gas. So here mu is gonna be uh, tau uh, n natural log of the partition function of one particle in a box minus natural log 
of n factorial um, negative. So negative and negative, positive. And you're going to have the same quantity except that it's going to be n natural log of z1 minus the natural log of n minus 1 factorial. So I guess we can write everything in the same row. It's going to be minus tau. N natural log of Z1 minus natural log of N factorial. Um, minus, because we have this negative in here, N natural log of Z1 plus So the natural log of z1 um, plus because it's a minus natural log of n minus one factorial. So this one goes away with this one, and so. This natural log is equal to natural log of n plus natural log of n minus one plus natural log of n minus two and so on. Um, all of these are negative, that's negative. This one is the same except that it starts at n minus one and is positive. So it will be natural log of n minus one plus natural log of n minus two and so on. And so all of these are going to cancel out. The only one that survives is this one over here. So then That means that mu chemical potential is minus tau natural log of n minus and plus natural log of z1. So, you know, if we put the negative in here, we can make this one a positive, this one a negative. Uh, then this will be natural log of n divided by z1. And z1 is quantum concentration times the volume. And divided number of particles divided by the volume is normal concentration. And we get the same thing as before. But the cool thing about this approach is that we didn't uh, use the Stirling approximation, which is good if that makes you uncomfortable. So this is the chemical potential of an ideal gas. So the next thing that we can look at is that the pressure, um, well, if you wanna go back to your baby physics, Right, that's the ideal gas law. Uh, so KVT is tau 
we divide by the volume, we get the pressure. And pressure should be written this way because otherwise we get confused. Um, N divided by the volume is the concentration. And so the pressure is N tau. Uh, this means that this implies that N is pressure. This is an ugly tau. Pressure over tau. So mu is equal to tau natural log of the pressure divided by the quantum concentration times tau. So these are equations. 12 uh, A and 12 B. So this is a pretty interesting equation. You know, the particles are going to move from a high chemical potential to a low chemical potential. So they will move from high pressure or high concentration regions to low pressure or low concentration regions. Is that what you would expect from a gas? Yeah, that's what they do. So what this equation tells you is that if you put, and you know every gas is close to ideal to some degree. If you put a gas in a, in a volume, the gas is going to feel the volume completely. Why? Because that minimizes its chemical potential. There's, you know, if, if you think about it from a Newtonian mechanics point of view, well, you need to apply some pressure or some constraint for the particles to remain in the same spot. Otherwise they're going to bounce among each other and just go in every direction, right? And since there's less particles elsewhere, well, they, it is less likely that they will collide. And so they will fill out space. So you can think about it you know, from a, a Newtonian mechanics point of view. What thermodynamics tells you is we don't care about the process, but particles have to fill space to minimize this potential. So I think that's pretty cool. And we derived all of these, you know, this is just counting particles and free energy is just counting the, uh, the states that are accessible to the system, so the entropy. We arrive at these results from the most basic math. Okay, the counting can get, you know, the process can get complicated. But in essence, we are just counting. And we are telling, uh, we, we are able to tell what the system has to do. We don't know how, that's part of other fields of physics. But it tells you what the system has to do. So it's pretty cool. What are the units of chemical potential? We can see it from over here. Joules, so chemical potential is an energy. Okay, so I'm gonna move a little bit faster over here so that we can finish this part. So the total potential, can you see that? 
Yes. Is equal to some external potential plus the internal potential. So this external potential can be, you know, gravitational. Um, um, chemical, well, uh, electromagnetic. I'm going to say chemical because it can be a bit confusing. You know, we can, that can be any, any potential uh, that you can think of. This internal potential is what we are defining as the chemical potential. So coming just from the density and the concentration or the pressure of the configuration of particles. So if we have two systems, mu one is gonna be mu one external plus mu one internal. If we have another one, mu two, that's gonna be mu two external plus mu to internal, okay? So if we take uh, in, in diffusive equilibrium, mu one is equal to mu two. So that means that mu two minus mu one, is equal to zero. So mu two external plus mu two internal minus mu one external minus mu one internal is equal to zero. So we can put the externals together. Um, mu two external minus mu one external plus mu two internal minus mu one internal equals zero. So this is just delta mu external and this one is just um, delta mu internal that's equal to zero. And so that means that the external is equal to minus the change in mu internal. This is equation 5.16. So it tells you about the, the interaction, the interplay of the external, which can be you know gravitational, and the internal potentials. If you change one and they are in diffusive equilibrium, the other one is going to change. Typically, it's easier to control the external than the internal. But I guess in this equation, there's no, there's no preference. Okay, so let's keep this in mind. And Let's think about, well, let's say that this external potential is the gravitational potential 
close to the earth, I guess close to the ground. So MGH. And from, again, from your, from baby physics. So the change in the external potential between two points, let's consider, I'm gonna put it over here. H equals zero and H. So this is the, the ground, the change in the external potential is going to be MGH minus MG zero, right? It's the ground. So it's going to be just MGH. So then the internal chemical potential the chemical potential is tau natural log over the quantum concentration. So this is going to be the parameter that we can change the concentration. So it's going to be the concentration, kind of like the right? um, in the ground and the density at some height. H is going to be, you know, function of that H. So the change in the internal chemical potential is going to be uh, well, tau natural log of N of H divided by NQ minus tau natural log N of zero divided by the quantum concentration. It's gonna be tau natural log of N at H this one dividing log of the quantum concentration minus tau of the natural log of n, the density in, in the ground, minus plus tau natural log of the quantum concentration. So the quantum concentrations go away. It doesn't depend on them. And this is just um, natural log, well, it's tau, natural log of the concentration at height h divided by the concentration in the ground. So that is Put it over here. So in diffusive equilibrium, you know, think about a layer of air that is at some height h and another layer that is in the ground. Um, if you have a very large number of layers in between, all the layers are going to be in diffusive uh, equilibrium. If you don't like this, you just think that H is very close to, to the ground. So in diffusive equilibrium, um, MGH is equal to minus tau natural log of NH divided by N zero. Okay, so we can move the tau to the other side. 
we can move the negative also. And then we can take the exponent of this whole thing, the exponent of the natural log, they're gonna cancel out. So we have, this is equal to n h divided by n zero. So the concentration, the density of a gas that is in a gravitational field close to the earth is equal to the density in the ground times the exponent of negative mgh over tau. If you let the critical height, oh, give me three more minutes. Uh, the critical height be uh, tau over mg, then we can rewrite this as h over hc. Uh, negative. And so the critical height is when the density decreases by 37% by e to the negative one. Okay, just before we go, um, this distribution, if we plot it, how is it going to look? It is the same as the Boltzmann distribution. So if this is the density um, at zero, it's gonna look like this. So this tells you that the atmosphere thins out as you go up, that most of the particles, the gas particles are going to be close to the ground and you have less and less as you go up. This is a really cool equation also because it tells you that the more massive the particles are, so hydrogen is very light. If you have you know, a nitrogen particle or oxygen like we have on Earth, the more massive particles are gonna be closer to the, to the ground. So essentially you can have a distribution like this one for each gas in the atmosphere. If G is greater, and remember that uh, G is constant mass of the planet, radius of the planet plus H squared. I put that one up here, radius of the planet plus h. Okay. If the acceleration due to gravity is larger, then you're going to have more particles closer to the ground, which makes sense. And if the temperature is higher, then you're going to have more particles farther away from the ground. So in combination with the solar wind, this tells you why the, the solar wind and the magnetic field, this tells you why Mars has a carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's a heavy gas. It doesn't have a, a magnetic field to protect its atmosphere. So only the densest, the heaviest gases are going to remain. The Earth has a magnetic field so it can protect its nitrogen and its hydrogen, but the hydro, sorry, the nitrogen and its oxygen, but the hydrogen is too light. It moves away and the, the solar wind uh, blows it away. So that's why we don't have hydrogen, at least much hydrogen in our atmosphere or Venus or Mercury, you know, you, um, you mentioned it in 
uh, it can be explained by this model. So yep, pretty cool. Um, going to stop recording.